my name's Graham Duham and I am a retired Thames mudlark. Uh, Tobias has asked me if I can show you one of my favourite finds. Um, I don't have favourite finds, unfortunately, because they're all favourites, so I uh, trust you can understand that. But I do have one find which I brought to um, London last week for the uh, book launch and showed a few people and they, I think they were a bit impressed, but I'll show it to you anyway. Um, this was found by myself with Pete Elkins back in 19, oh, I, I don't know, mid 1970s, probably 1980. We were working in Queen Heights Dock and um, Pete was down the hole and I was on the top just checking what he was throwing out on the end of his shovel. And he'd been down there some while and he said to me, I think it's about time you came down here and did some hard work. So I said, OK, and he started to clamber out. And as he did, he said to me, there's a friend of yours down there sticking out of the side of the um, side of the, the mud. So um, as I went down there, I looked in and indeed there was. And that was what I saw. So gingerly, I pulled it out and I thought, oh, is this going to be a, a, a complete one? Is it? Is it? Yes. Yes, it is. It is. It is. I'm sure it's going to be. And there it is. A complete 15th century knife. Um, and what is delightful about this knife is the fact it's got an amazing bladesmith or cutler's mark. Can you see it? That's two toads. Um, we will never ever know who made it because there's no information on the makers of these medieval pieces at all. They might be described occasionally in some kind of article that was done in that time, but uh, never, never would they say who, who made it. So we don't know. But uh, nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece. And uh, it, uh, it makes coming up the Thames worthwhile all the time. And I'm going to be a bit sneaky here because um, uh, Tobias said, show them one thing. But I'm going to show you two anyway. So this, but this piece, it'll make your mouth water. I know it will. Here it is. Isn't that the best key you've ever seen? It's, um, it's about 1500. And it's as good as the day it went into the river. I've got a collection of keys, but uh, all from the river. So OFT is quite generous, has been quite generous to me. So um, we used to go down, I used to go down on Sunday mornings and uh, for the, I did it for 16 years. And um, I, was th I thoroughly loved it. It was part of my life. Once you go down there and find things, you're hooked, aren't you? You know about that. So um, that's, um, that's sort of my story. So if you if you want to have any help or anything, please give me a call and I'll, I'll try and help you or, or um, maybe offer some advice or whatever, but it's up to you. But uh, in the meantime, have a super Christmas if you can and be incredibly lucky next year. And um, I look forward to meeting you sometime. I, I, I should have met some more people when I came up on, on Sunday to see the... Uh, launching of the book. It was an amazing room. It's it full of noise, smiling faces and laughter. And that's how life should be, shouldn't it? But um, I hope to talk to you some more, to, to some more of you who I haven't met yet. So as I say, have a great Christmas and uh, maybe I'll see you next year. Bye. Hello everyone. Merry Christmas. I'm Charlie, a Thames mudlark. I've been mudlarking for about three years. Um, back in September, the day before my 30th birthday, I was walking along the Thames. Um, I wasn't even in my mudlarking outfit and have my knee pads or my waterproofs or anything like I normally wear. I uh, just had a little plastic bag for my finds. Didn't expect to find much. Um, I was walking near the shoreline and I spotted this incredible, partially complete Roman oil lamp just sitting on the surface, face up, waiting for me, like a little early birthday present. Incredible little thing. Um, so it would have been made in Gaul, probably, uh, which is part of the Roman Empire in Europe. Um, and it's got a little face in the middle, so it's a little Greek style theatre mask. So it's partially complete, so it would have had a little handle here and a nozzle here where the wick would have gone. And it's a bit broken at the back, but that does incredibly allow us to see the fingerprints of the potter where they kind of smoothed the wet clay into the two-part mould almost, almost 2,000 years ago, which is incredible to me. 
Um, so I've produced a little um, reconstructive illustration here showing how the rest of it would have looked. So it's got the nozzle there and the handle. So the fact that it had a handle means that it was a really convenient portable source of light for the Romans. So these lamps would have been mainly used in um, urban centres, particularly in London, as they never really gained the same popularity that they did in the Mediterranean, um, just uh, to do with reasons such as shortages of oil, um, things like that. So they're quite rare finds. Um, so I'd love to find the rest of this one day, like the handle and the nozzle, but for now I'm incredibly happy with this. One of my favourite ever finds. So, thank you. Good morning guys, Merry Christmas, happy festive season wherever you're watching from in the world. I'm on the Thames foreshore this morning, it's minus two degrees and um, it's cold but it's absolutely beautiful being down here. Um, my name's Mark, I've been mudlarking for just over three years and uh, Tobias recently asked me to um, do this little video um, of one of my all-time favorite Thames finds. So yeah, this is definitely one of my all-time favorites. I actually found it around about this time uh, two years ago, so just before Christmas two years. So a lovely early Christmas present. Um, why is it my favorite find? Well, not only because of its age and because of its function, but actually how I found it. And I often find that that is the case for me. It's um, like a find is special to me, not just because of what it is, but of also because of how I found it. Um, and in this particular find, I found on a night lark on a very uh, dark foreshore, and uh, it was partially exposed, so it was kind of that way up, um, and just partially exposed, just eroding out of the mud. And um, I actually thought it was a broken glass vessel. That's what it looked like at the time. Uh, like the the, um, the 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 cup sort of uh, end of the glass, um, but when I pulled it up and I saw the uh, the loop, I immediately recognised that it was a um, that it was a, a crotal bell, and um, to much to my surprise, when I got it out, it was packed with mud, but much to my surprise, um, I noticed that the clapper was still intact and it's attached to a little. Sort of copper alloy wire and it looks brand new um, like it could have been made like it could have been attached there yesterday so yeah and um, so I found it I unpacked the mud from it and then I rung it um, I rung it and, uh, <laughs> and that was the first time that uh, sound had um, you know had manifested itself for well five six hundred years it's a um sort of late medieval to tudor so ad 1400 to 1500 it's been recorded on the portable antiquity scheme database um at the museum of london and uh as you can see it also has um some um some decoration going over the top so it has four of these shields going all the way around these little square top shields which are decorated with a uh, impaled eagle oh, sorry a displayed eagle and three uh, impaled chevrons I think that's how it's described on uh, the portable antiquity scheme database and um, yeah, just hearing that sound when I rung the bell uh, on a really dark and cold foreshore, you know, two years ago, um, it was just one of the most amazing feelings I've, I've ever had, you know, discovering this piece of history and just listening to that sound, which would have rung out uh, five, six hundred years ago to warn um, people that there was, you know, that there was a horse approaching or so. This probably would have been worn alongside maybe, I don't know, several other crotal bells. Um, attached to the horse's harness and uh, the displayed eagle and uh, impaled chevrons as they're described are quite likely to be the arms of Nuremberg so there you go a, be a beautiful find Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way <laughs> Merry Christmas everyone
everyone, wherever you are in the world watching this Thames Foreshore Finds Christmas video, I hope that you are having a fantastic time, whatever you are doing. I'm really excited to be participating in this video with my Thames Foreshore Finds friends, and so thank you very much, Tobias, for inviting me to join, because it means I get to sit here and talk to you for a few moments about my favourite find of all time. And let me tell you, it's so difficult choosing a favourite find as a mudlark. And this year, in particular, in 2022, I have found so many wonderful things. It's been so hard to choose a favourite. But my favourite is something that I found several years ago now, before I started making YouTube videos, actually. And for me, it's the very essence of mudlarking, this particular find. But before I show you it, let me just show you a couple of my favourite finds from this year. One of them is this extremely long clay pipe. Now this is the longest clay pipe that I've ever found. And the fact that it's still in one piece is nothing short of a miracle. It is made by uh, William Cope. He was a Woolwich clay pipe maker and it has some Masonic emblems here on the bowl. It's absolutely stunning. And this one takes pride of place in my Thames clay pipe collection. Now, another one of my favorite finds, and actually I didn't find it this year, I found it the year before, but it is this beautiful onion bottle. Just look at it. You can tell why they're called onion bottles, really, can't you? Because this just looks like a mini onion bottle. And when I found it, it was in several pieces. So I managed to stick all the pieces back together. And you'd hardly know that it was broken now. And I love to imagine when I'm holding it, who the last person was that held it before me, um, what their life was like. This bottle actually dates back to about 1690 and it could have belonged to a sailor or somebody working in a dockyard. Of course, we'll never know, but that is the great thing about mudlarking. It gets your imagination going. And so this is a very, very precious mudlarking find. So what is my favorite find and why? Well, you know what? It's actually this little piece of metal here. And the reason I love it so much is that there is a name on it and an address. And so this piece of metal actually unraveled a whole story right in front of me. On this piece of metal, it says F Jury 72 Woolwich Road, SE 10. And so I was able to find out all about this man whose name is actually Frederick Jury. And Frederick Jury was born in about 1876 but he fought in World War I, but he didn't fight for England. Strangely, he actually went all the way over to Australia and joined the Australian Imperial Force. And that could be because he was too old, maybe, to join the British Army. But whatever the reason was, he came back from Australia and fought in the trenches. He was hit by a grenade. He lost several fingers. Um, he had quite a lot of operations. He was discharged from the army with an honourable mention and a, and a medal for honourable service. And then he married his landlady. Um, and you would think that that was the end of the story, having found out all this about his life. But the nice thing is I managed to find out where he was buried. He died in um, 1932. And with the help of a very kind cemetery keeper in Greenwich, I was able to find his grave in a cemetery not very far from where I live. And he's actually buried in a pauper's grave. And so for me, this little piece of metal, it's just one of the reasons I mudlark because I'm able to tell a story of a man who had a remarkable life, who fought for his country, um, who then died and ended up in a pauper's grave and whose story wouldn't otherwise have been told. And now so many people around the world know all about Frederick Jury of 72 Woolwich Road. So mudlarking finds aren't all about silver and gold and precious things. So many people ask me what the most expensive thing is that I've found. But really, the value of a find is really the story behind it, and I'm sure that so many other mudlarks would agree with that. So here is my favourite find, F Jury, 
72 Woolwich Road. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope you like my Christmas outfit. And um, I hope that you go on to have an excellent Christmas and an absolutely wonderful new year full of beautiful blessings. Thank you very much and see you again very soon. The find I'd like to show you today is a medieval shard of pottery and it has a story to tell about a pandemic and its after effects. Um, this was made at Mill Green in Essex which was a major supplier to London at the time. It's got a very sandy fabric and there are tiny flecks of shiny mica in the clay. Uh, there's a sandwich effect which is not unusual on medieval pottery with a grey core and different coloured surfaces and it has a very nice copper green glaze. Now um, it comes from a class of vessels known as highly decorated jugs which were produced from 1270 to 1350 and they all have a variety of different effects which cover the whole vessel. Um, this one has incised decoration and a nice glaze but you also find roller stamping, combing um, and different colours of glaze, often two colours on the same vessel. Now these jugs, the highly decorated jugs, disappear from the archaeological record about 1350 which coincides with the arrival of the Black Death or bubonic plague in Britain at that time. So it's too much of a coincidence that they should disappear at that time. So there are a couple of reasons why they disappear, possibly because of a lack of trained potters to make the highly decorated things, but also interestingly as a reaction to the effects of the pandemic and the trauma it caused on the population, seeing that between a quarter and a third of people in Britain died at that time from the disease, um, that there was consumer preference for plainer, simpler, undecorated pottery. And undecorated pottery is very rare, very rare for, um, oh, over a hundred years after that time. So a little shard, but one of my favourite finds from the Thames foreshore. and I've been asked to show my favourite finds of 2022 and they are both pieces of Thomas Beckett, uh, they're fragments of Thomas Beckett pilgrim badges and it seemed appropriate to show them in my little medieval local church which is literally at the end of my road in Brighton, it's called St Peter's of Preston Park, it's 13th century and it has this magnificent fresco of Thomas Beckett being murdered and it was damaged in a fire in 1906 but it's still absolutely beautiful. There's also uh, more, more over here and a nativity scene over here, all sadly damaged but uh, you get a very good impression of how they were. So my favourite finds have been two pieces of Thomas Beckett badge and this bust here I found uh, at the end of January in the dark by the light of my head torch. And it was the badge I had been looking for the whole time I'd been a mudlark. So this is just Thomas Beckett's bust with his mitre and his cope. It's a bit battered, but absolutely recognisable. Uh, and this was going to be my favourite find of all time until in August, I was lucky enough to find this Thomas Beckett torso. Um, and this is from a much bigger badge and something that I instantly, well, within about two minutes, recognised as being part of a badge that I had found three years previously. So this is a very, very sumptuous, um, quite extraordinary badge showing Thomas Beckett 
on a horse riding back to Canterbury when he returned from exile in France. So this is, for, in fact, they're both 14th century, um, but this is exquisitely made. Um, they were both found relatively close to London Bridge um, and on the old London Bridge there had been a shrine to Thomas Beckett. So these are my absolute favourite finds of the year um, and although it's very unlikely I'll find something, I'm going to carry on looking for Thomas Beckett's head and the horse's head here and that really would be a for sure miracle. Anyway, these are my best finds of the year. Um, thank you for letting me show them. I wish you all a very, very happy Christmas and a really good hunting in 2023. I hope you all find the things that make your heart sing. Happy Christmas. Hello, all friends of uh, Mudlarking. My name is Adam. I've been searching Thames Forshaw for the last seven years. Uh, I have some uh, items that I'd like to show it to you and uh, one of my favorite finds from the Thames Foreshore. So without further ado, uh, let me begin. First item that I would like to share with you is a nearly intact pewter spoon with a portrait of Queen Anne. Uh, next to her head, as you can see, there are two cupids which were lifting a little crown. That part is missing, uh, but um, other than this, um, this spoon is in a great condition. As you can see underneath, we've got a little floral design, uh, which is also at the back of the spoon. Um, we do have a, a Marcus initials. It's two uh, letters T and P. Uh, unfortunately, a fellow uh, officer who was uh, recording this item um, couldn't um, pin this uh, initials to any of the Marcus known Marcus. Uh, but still, it's a great um, example of the Royal uh, Portrait Spoons. It's one of my uh, best finds from the Times for sure. Uh, I really love design. Uh, and uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, you barely ever find uh, those kind of spoons uh, being uh, intact. I was surprised to and lucky to, to find this item from uh, on the foreshore. Um, the pewter is really bendy and, and, and breakable uh, metal, uh, therefore I was really, really happy to see uh, this spoon in this condition. Um, second item uh, that I, I chose to share with you is uh, it's a Roman brooch. Uh, this kind of uh, brooch uh, calls uh, crossbow brooch. Um, it's been made around 3rd and 4th century. As you can see, we are missing uh, uh, part of the brooch, which probably would have ended around uh, this uh, this uh, size, this part. Uh, we are missing also uh, some pin that would uh, connect uh, pinned material with with a brooch. But still, it's one of my favorite finds from Forshaw because it's one of the first items that I found on the Forshaw. Um, it was my second time. Uh, as soon as I, 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 I found it, this uh, this brooch, I knew what it was. Uh, I was I was hoping to find more ever since then, uh, but uh, this is only uh, one example from Forshaw that I have in my collection. Uh, still, I really like uh, this item uh, because uh, this is an item that I used to read in the books. And uh, I was really surprised to find it on a, on a foreshore. Um, this this kind of brooch uh, you can also pin it to um, military, as most of uh, examples were found next to military camps. So who knows? Maybe this uh, brooch was lost by some Roman soldier around 16, 1700 years ago. Um, uh, the third item that I would like to uh, share with you uh, today is a uh, Roman coin. Uh, it's a coin of uh, Constantine the Great. This coin was minted in uh, today's Lyon, uh, which is which is France now. Um, this coin is really in really great condition. I really like it the the way uh, it looks like. 
um, the portrait of the, the soldier is, is uh, really great condition, detail. You can see all of little uh, details, some pins, some uh, his helmet. Um, uh, you, you can't get better really with that kind of portrait. Uh, then on the back, we have a uh, wolf with two brothers, uh, Ramus and Romulus, who um, built Rome, uh, which just, uh, like I said, this coin is uh, one of the best finds for me too, due to all of the details, all of the information that you can find on such a little coin. Um, so this is uh, three items that I showed to you today. Uh, if you want to read a bit more about those items, I will share the link to uh, find site, uh, which you can read and find more information about it. Thank you for listening uh, and I would like to wish you Merry Christmas, Happy New Year and lots of great finds from the folk show. Thank you. Hello there. I'm here at the River Thames Foreshore to show you my finds of the year. I couldn't decide, so I brought them, I brought two of them. Um, this is, this is a hammered coin Charles I and it was the first coin I found after Prince Charles became King Charles III so it's a very important coin to me also it's off my bucket list and this one uh, this is a coin, a Roman coin that I've uh, recently found. It is a copper alloy Roman dipondios of Fontania. It is dated uh, between 41 and 54 AD. Antonia was mother of Claudius. I would like to wish you Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Full of great finds from River Thames for sure. One of my favorite finds from this year is um, this piece of a Roman lamp that I found in June. Um, it's a double nozzle lamp. Um, the oil would have been um, filled from here and there would have been two wicks, one here and one here, for the flame to um, burn. And um, I've made these drawings um, based on the find. Um, so here's the find and it would have had a, a central hole and a handle at the end to hold it. And because of my work as a sculpture technician, I could look at this find and actually work out how it was made. See there that that is actually the um, fingerprint of the potter who pressed clay into a mold nearly 1,700 years ago. And I can also see that the mould had two parts. There's a seam line there. Um, and also how the clay has been pushed through to make the, the nozzle. And with all of that information and my experience as a sculpture technician, I could actually make a replica of this lamp. So I made a mould, a plaster mould in two halves and pressed clay into the mould and joined it together and added a handle and that allowed me to make this replica. So if I put this down 
next to the original, just move the mould out the way, you can see that's what it would have looked like originally. So that is, an, for me, an amazing connection to, um, to the maker and um, looking, looking at this was like having a, a manual ha that was actually telling me ha how to make it. So that was like really special and really exciting. And on the back of mine, I've put MF, which stands for Marcus, a Latin version of my name, F for Fecit made it. So that actually says Mark made this. Okay, thank you. Hope you enjoy watching that. Hi, I'm Sam and I've been mudlarking on the Thames for four years now. Tobias asked me to make a video to show you my favourite find of the year and um, I'd like to show you something which I actually only found uh, in the in the, the week uh, that's just passed so it's very new to me and it immediately became my favourite find of the year. It's an early Tudor uh, ivory knife handle and I don't find a lot of knife handles so I was really pleased to find one but this one's really special so um, if if I show you it's quite difficult to uh, to capture because it's very small and very detailed but um, perhaps if I can get it in the right light um, you can see um, some of the amazing work in there it's a style of work called uh, pique work um, which forms a pattern of really, really tiny, tiny dots to make an incredibly detailed, beautiful pattern. And it's also been inlaid with um, little circles of ivory that's been dyed uh, to red and green colours to make this really, really beautiful pattern. Um, so if I rotate it, perhaps um, the other side has got a little bit more damage on it, um, but perhaps you can see some of the detail on it and there's the other side again um now when i first found it um from a distance it looked like it might be a modern chicken bone because it's very pale and the bones found in the thames are usually very dark um and i just happened to notice that it had a little bit of a pattern on it because it looked quite different when i first found it and it was wet it was freshly washed uh, washed in um, and I looked at it closely and I realised um, that it, in fact it was ivory and you can tell it's ivory if you can perhaps see on the end there are some um, sort of faint stripes and those are called Schrager lines and that is what tells you um, that, um, that a material is ivory and it can even tell you what type of ivory it is if you're expert enough. Um, ivory is quite fragile and it tends to fracture quite easily into little squares and strips. So I've stabilised the, the, the knife handle with a material called Paraloid, which is a conservator's glue, which will impregnate it and just help to keep it in one piece. Um, and the reason conservators use it is because it's completely reversible. Um, but it will help this object to last and for it not to deteriorate off of the ivory to split and break up as it dries. Um, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a really, really beautiful object and I'm delighted with it and I, I hope you've enjoyed seeing it. Uh, Merry Christmas and happy hunting for 2023. Years ago, on the Thames, it's a child dental palette, Victorian. And what's special about this one is made of solid gold. And it's got real teeth in the front of it. And a lot of these teeth either came from uh, the mortuary where they got the dead body from, so the dead teeth. Or sometimes they got children's teeth to donate teeth to the, uh, the dentist to make these. But this is quite rare because it's a, it's a complete one. And it's made, it, uh, you don't often see a gold one. Most in metal or platinum or whatever. It's quite popular with the well off during the Victorian times. Um, there's a lot of history about them, but a lot of it's been lost, unfortunately.
but um, a lot of metal detectors find them, especially inland. But this is uh, the best one that's been found on the Thames so far. Hi Tobias and hi everybody, Merry Christmas! I'm here um, to add my contribution to the Merry Christmas video. I recorded actually a video yesterday with what I thought was my best find of the year and then last night I went mudlarking and I, find something, I found something that was probably even better. So I'm reshooting the video and presenting both finds that are very dear to me. So the first one that I originally selected is something I found in January last year and it's this token which you probably are struggling to see but it says it's so an octagonal token and it says john pierce feversham 1667 and on the other side there is a dolphin and it says um he's half penny so this is clearly a token from the mid 17th century when there was not enough currency in uh, london and in england and therefore businesses started to create their own tokens there are thousands of traders token that's the name known and uh, this is quite special because it's octagonal and out of the several thousands known traders token there are only probably 200 that has this bizarre shape so this found in January was by far my favorite one and it was also my favorite because due to the several details on the um, token I've managed to find out a lot of history of, of the owner of this business. The business was a tavern, it was called the Dolphin and that's why there is a little dolphin uh, represented. It looks like a fish with fangs but that's an archaic way of depicting dolphins. It was a, a tavern and a pub and uh, of course it, was, it, it existed already in 1667, the time of the token, but then it continued to exist up to um, half of the 20th century. Several archives uh, talk about weird stories that happened there. One is that in 1855, uh, a little kid was sleeping in the tavern with his daughter and he was playing with matches. And the one match is called Lucifer match in the report. Uh, actually had a spark that went too far, uh, set the room on fire and the little boy grabbed his sleeping daughter, took her out and saved her from uh, the flames. And again, I think it was around 1940 when there was a wedding uh, at Gravesend uh, near the estuary and um, the couple that got married went to spend the, the first night at the hotel. The husband, after the reception, said he wasn't feeling well, he went to sleep and he died during the night so it's quite an unfortunate story and you know the tavern existed then until 1950s when the the building was demolished and now there is a store uh, on a modern building which is quite unfortunate but so this was my favorite and then all of a sudden last night i saw a little shirt coming out something like this and i realized it was a piece of pottery i thought it was victorian but then i took it out uh -huh. And it turned out to be this amazing, amazing Bellarmine piece. So it's from a, a Bartman or Bellarmine jug, which is a 16th uh, to 17th century um, wine bottle. I mean, anybody that is interested in Madlarki knows what a Bellarmine jug is, so I won't spend too much time on it. But this is really special to me because it's not only extremely large, look at that, it's half of it, but the whole medallion with a flower is still present. And there is also a very nice beard of the Bartman. Um, so if anybody thinks that has seen a match of this, let's reunite them. But until until that moment, from the bearded man on the foreshore, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Bye.
Christmas. Merry Christmas. I'm Anna, also known as Foreshore Seashore on Instagram, and I am going to show you not one, but two interrelated finds from this year. First of all, I'm going to cover this up for the transition so you don't see up my nose. And there we go, revealed. My first find, this wonderful bottle seal from the 1600s with peacock iridescence. I'd searched for one of these for about seven years. So it would have been affixed to a bottle like this, though not a bottle looking like this. Imagine an onion bottle. And when the owner took uh, the, the bottle along to the local tavern to have it refilled with wine, they knew it wouldn't get lost because their initials were on it. Um, so it had that function. This would also prove that the owner was a cut above the rest because glass was pretty expensive, which is why you'd want the bottle back. But if you could spend that extra cash and have it personalised in this way, it proved you had some money to spare. Obviously, if you had a lot of money to spare, you'd really go for it with a coat of arms or something. Now, so I really love this find. Now, at the end of the year, this was found on the incoming tide in March. This was found right up high against a back wall very recently. It's this wonderful mould for a seal made out of pipe clay. It's 100 years older than the bottle seal. And it also amazingly says MP. So you'd have to print it like that. It's not a bottle seal maker because it would have incised the image. The image wouldn't stand proud as they do on seals. But according to a Dutch clay pipe expert, it was probably used for imprinting food in the 1700s. They're really big on decorating cakes and pastries, marzipan, bread, butter. Back in the day, if you have a Google, you'll see. So I think either that was the person who was throwing the party or it was the maker of the goods themselves. I mean, finally, it could possibly be a maker's mark for a pot. And I have seen an example which is plausible. Anyway, those are my two favourite finds because they are united. One is the result, one is the maker. They top and tail the year. They have this odd um, uh, similarity, having the same initials, and they're rather beautiful. And this one, I think, is the only example known. Um, it, it, there's no, no other example on the PAS database. So there we go. And Merry Christmas to you! All right, mud lovers, and everyone that follows Tim's Foreshore Finds Facebook group. What an amazing year it's been for finds. Loads of stuff's come up. My particular favourite that I found is my brass tobacco tin. What an adventure that was. Me and Rob went across the Thames in his little dinghy and we had an amazing day. So as you know, I put out a lot of videos myself on YouTube so we can relive that moment and also the history behind it. Yeah, so here we are. Looks like it could be a tin, very much so. As you can see, I want to give it a little wiggle because I wanted to make sure it is what it is. That looks really cool, doesn't it? Oh, look, it's got some engraving on it. <gasps> oh, wow, I can see a date. I can see a date. I think it says 1917. Rob, you got to come and see this, mate. Wow. Let's wash it off. <laughs> wow. Look, look at that, guys. A dated tin. 1715, uh, sorry, 1714. Oh man, the initials on it. That is so cool, something on the back as well. Oh, it's, it's hand engraved. Imagine if it's full of, I'm sure it's full of mud, but imagine if it's full of coins. Now these are generally tobacco tins, but what a personalized item. That is amazing. What does that say, is that a two or an IB? I don't know, fantastic. Oh man, made up. Look at that, you can see where it's been stuck in the mud all those years. Ah, oh, fantastic. What an awesome find. That's got to be my find of the year so far. Brilliant! So let's take a moment to appreciate the sheer beauty and age of such an amazing tin. In 1714, the War of the Spanish Succession ended, the Dutch were rioting over the rise of tax on beer, and the typewriter was invented by Englishman Henry Mill. The monogram on the front looks to be a mashup of a few letters. I can see a G and an N, maybe an O and a B. I'll take it to the Museum of London and let their experts work it out too. There is, however, a clue on the reverse. It looks like the person had a little practice first. Maybe they were honing their engraving skills before they worked on the front. On the underneath, it looks like it might be an N and then definitely a B. Unfortunately, the hinge was broken. The metal bar that held it together had perished, so I've used an old Thames pin that works a treat. Now it opens and closes perfectly. 
Imagine the last face the inside of this box saw before it was closed some 300 years ago. Well, we might be able to find out. So here comes the amazing bit. I said in the video that I saw some scratches on the inside. And there's something on the inside as well. I think it's just a couple of scratches. So I took my eyeglass to have a closer look and indeed there is. Not just scratches, but small letters too. I can see a W and a B and a little diamond and some other doodles. But the best bit is what I think to be a surname. Can you see that? It's the word Bright. B-R-I-G-H-T. Wow, now if that is the surname of the owner of the tin, then that's incredible. Sadly, none of the records that I can access online go back that far. So I plan to take this to the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich as well as the Museum of London and ask if they have any records of a Bright in the Navy in 1714. Now I thought this was a Dutch tobacco tin because very often they are. The one I found in 2014 came from the Netherlands with its beautiful engraved tavern scene and Dutch writing. Now that was an amazing find, but this one has the date and most likely the surname of the person who owned it. And I believe Bright is an English name. So there you go, that's my find of the year. I'm so happy with that. What, a, what an amazing find that was and so much history packed into that little box. Um, it's currently being recorded with the Museum of London. So if they find out any other information, then I'm sure to let you guys know. Anyway, thank you very much for Thames Foreshore Finds for all your amazing work throughout the year and a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to every single mud lover out there. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Rob. Uh, I'm new to the group. Um, uh, forgive me, I'm not in mudlarking or detecting a tyre. I, I couldn't get down to the foreshore to film this today, so I filmed it as soon as I've, I've come back from work. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm new. I'm new here. Um, I've actually only been detecting metal detecting for the past week, uh, but I've been mudlarking since kind of Feb or, or March. Um, I decided to make the jump over detecting a little while ago, and I picked up a, a nice little laser rapier uh, for the foreshore. But unfortunately, I couldn't find the right coil. I needed a smaller coil, so finally that turned up. Managed to get one of those. Um, Headed down to the, the Thames uh, in the past week. I met uh, Tobias on the foreshore. He's been giving me some brilliant uh, advice around uh, what my machine is, is telling me. And on the second day, I managed to uh, locate a Roman coin, which I'm reliably informed. Sorry, the uh, quality is terrible, but there will be photos. It's uh, Constantine the First, um, which I believe is quite is this is more common Roman coin. Uh, but I've sent it to the flow uh, just because it, it needed a bit of electrolysis, um, but uh, and a portrait is there. I just need confirmation from the flow as to if it's definitely a um, Constantine one. Um, so yeah, that awaits confirmation. So really, really happy with that on my second day uh, of detecting. So hopefully that's a sign of things to come. Um, there's some other finds that I suppose we've been proud of this year. Um, uh, I guess one would be the Thames Garnet. Um, I was always, it's always good to, to, to come across that and uh, I found a nice little patch of, of Garnet. So um, yeah, I'm really happy with those. Uh, just because I, I like the story behind them or the myth behind them as well. Um, uh, and musket balls was on the list. They were evading me for a long time. I uh, finally found them with a metal detector. So I found a couple of musket balls. So yeah, very happy. Um, why, why am I, what do I feel about mudlarking or detecting? Uh, why did I get into it? Um, well, I love history. Uh, and that, I suppose that got me into it. And, you know, the sound of, uh, you know, ultimately being, being able to be a bit of an archaeologist, um, on the Thames. I was like, yeah, absolutely. I want to get into that. So, um, so that's what got me into it. Really, is just the history. The history, but it's not until you start researching the objects that you find that you actually really, really fall for this this hobby, this passion. Um, you know, it could be a thing that's a thousand years old to to something that's twenty years old, but everything's got a story. Some of it's personal. It's it's amazing, and it's that it's that journey that you go on to kind of find that that history. It's it's. It's fantastic. Um, the other thing I found that's it's extremely peaceful uh, in a in a city, capital city with you know eight point eight million people. The foreshore is a very peaceful place. So it's a lovely place to collect your thoughts and just enjoy your time. Um, but it's also nice to see different parts of London. You know, you, 
from Richmond to, to Greenwich, you know, Rotherhive, just places, places that you might not normally go, bits of the foreshore, you know, on your long walks and looking for ways down onto the foreshore, you come across nice buildings, nice people, and it's it's just a different aspect that I didn't think of uh, until I've started doing this. So, yeah, this is why I do this hobby. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. Um, brilliant end to the year. Um, uh, and hopefully I may see some of you on the foreshore. Um, but yeah, Merry Christmas and um, Happy New Year. Happy holidays. Hello and greetings from the River Thames foreshore. It's high tide now and here I am and I'm going to show you now my chosen find of the year. So here we are, that's my chosen find. It's a tiny little coin. You, you can barely see the portrait of the monarch. It's not in very good condition. So why did I choose this find? Why is it so special? So I'll tell you in a minute. So um, a couple of months ago, I think, I found an object on the Thames foreshore and it didn't look at all like a coin. In fact, it looked really like a piece of metal, but luckily I decided to keep it, which I did. So I took it home and uh, eventually I decided to give it a clean but it was almost impossible to clean it and then the next step was to use electrolysis which I did eventually and whilst I was doing the electrolysis I realized that the object was a silver coin but I couldn't see the portrait because it was bent. So my next step was going to be that I had to flatten it out, which I did. And then I could see the, the portrait of King Henry VIII. So that was a big plus. Finding something that, you know, I gave nothing to it, which turned out to be a, a, a coin, which I believed was from uh, King Henry VIII. But starting on my research, I couldn't find any match of all the Henry VIII coins in my books. And then my next step was to see if there was any other monarch that would have a Henry VIII portrait, which eventually I found out that um, this is a coin issued during the reign of King Edward VI. So it's a posthumous coin. Henry VIII died on the 28th of January 1547 and he was succeeded by his nine-year-old son Edward who became King Edward VI in 1547. So the coin was issued after Henry VIII's death. So it's a posthumous coin. And posthumous coins are minted after the death of a monarch to celebrate and commemorate them. So that's why I've chosen this particular find here, which from nothing, it became a super find, which I'm very proud of. It's my very first posthumous coin from the River Thames for sure. It's my very first coin from King Edward VI. But the main reason I've chosen this find is just to prove sometimes a find can be absolutely nothing when you find it. But it's not all about finding uh, something on the Thames foreshore. It's what happens afterwards. The cleaning process, the research, and then sometimes it, it can actually turn out to be something which, you know, you could be proud of, which 
I am in this particular case here. But a few days ago, literally less than a week ago, I found something on the Thames foreshore which um, I couldn't resist and you know I had to bring you here today to show you which is this I'm not going to go in details about that because my plan is to publish a separate video so I can talk separately about this particular find but it's a, it's a, it's a super find, it's a great find it's the oldest find from the Thames foreshore so far for me in terms of dates it's an Iron Age coin I have found an Iron Age coin before but this one is earlier than that it's a potting and it dates from 75 to 55 BC and this uh, as you can see there it's an outline head of the Greek god Apollo I don't know whether you can see that but on the reverse outline button bull the head of a bull so it's a super find I'm very proud of because it's my very first it's uh, my the oldest find from the Thames and again uh, just to show I had no idea when I found it it looked like absolutely nothing but luckily I, f I kept it and uh, doing the research and posting in the group and uh, talking to colleagues I realized that I had a, a major find so from the River Thames my very best wishes for a very happy new year 2023 Happy hunting in 2023. Bring lots of finds from uh, our dear river Thames and post them in the group. We are always happy to see them. We're always there to help you identifying your finds and never ignore a find. It's very important. So Merry Christmas to you all and all your families. And I'll see you in the new year. Merry Christmas. Christmas everybody. So this is me, Monica Butling-Smith. I'm one of the admins on the River Thames Foreshore Finds page and um, this is Frida, my dog, who we're going to say hello to and then say off you go Frida, off you go, good girl. Um, I'm going to show you some of the finds that I've had this year that make me happy anyway. Um, I've had quite a few little bits and pieces. <laughs> um, really, go, 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 go. But um, these are ones that I particularly like, I'm quite excited by. So probably one of the first, I'm going to start with something that's not particularly valuable, but I find absolutely fascinating. It's a very simple pair of tweezers. It's been handmade, probably pre-industrialization, so pre-1850. Um, it's just a pair of, um, pair of tweezers made out of a twisted copper wire. Um, and the ends have been bashed flat and crimped. So it actually is quite grippy. And bizarrely enough, out, yes, you see, it works. You can actually pull out hairs with it. So nearly 200 years old, still totally perfectly functioning. And I love the fact it's been handmade by somebody and they must've been very cross to lose it. So some whiskery old gentleman ended up being a little more whiskery than he ought to have been because he lost his tweezers. So I quite like that. Um, Another thing that I found here, oh, now this one is absolutely beautiful. It's very, very tiny. I'll take a photograph to put into the frame later. Um, and it's basically a um, Tudor um, needle case made out of pewter. It's not complete, obviously. This is the top half of the bottom section and it would have had a matching lid. It would have had little, well, it has got the remnants of two little lugs there and two little lugs there and the lid would have had lugs on it as well. It would have been threaded onto a little bit of string or chain that the owner would have worn either around her neck or hanging off a chatelet. What's really special about this is on this side, you can just about, or that, sorry, that side, you can see an ID, which is the maker's mark. And on the other side, you can see 1642, which is the year it was made. 
So in mudlarking, we're always very excited when we can work out a, a good date, and that gives us a very solid date, so 1642. If you look at it closely, it's really pretty. It's got little flowers um, impressed into the pewter, um, roses, Tudor roses and daisies and little foliate leaves as well. It's, it's very, very pretty. So I don't mind that it's not complete because, to be honest, I've got the most exciting bit. I've got the make mark initials and the date. So that, whoop, right. that one makes me very happy. Hence, I throw it across the room. <laughs> Sorry, pick it up again, pop it back on the tray. Um, so yeah, that was the needle case. Another one that I found that's also quite likely to roll around. And now that one we can all recognize from a distance. It's just a very, very, very large um, Venetian chevron bead, um, also called Rosetta beads at times. These are made up of many layers of different color glass cane and then filed off at the edges so that you can see these pretty chevron patterns. Um, this is probably the largest um, trade bead that I've ever found. Um, by trade bead, we basically mean that it was sold from England um, and taken over to probably North or West Africa um, and exchanged for goods and sadly people sometimes over there. Um, absolutely beautiful bead with quite a dark history. We think it's probably 17 to 1800s, could be a bit earlier, could be a bit later, um, but that one's rather exciting. I quite like that one. Um, and then my last find, which doesn't look like much, but really, really excites me, is this, which is a Rondell dagger handle. Now, a Rondell dagger um, is one of the, this, this particular Rondell dagger is one of the earliest forms of uh, combat fighting daggers used around, this one was probably made um, about 1350 to 1400. Um, uh, later Rondell daggers had very pronounced round Rondells at the top and at the bottom. Um, and the knife, the, the tang blade would go down there. This one is made out of wood and it's been carved. So at the top of it, I don't know if you can make it out, it's got an octagonal form here. Um, and it would, yes, very, very exciting. It would have had a through tang, with a little metal knop on the end, and probably a big, it's not a bone, Frida, it's not a bone. <laughs> a big round rondelle at the base. Um, it's used in fighting, uh, particularly useful for, pro poking people between bits of armour um, and in, in it's, it would have been the blade would have been sharp enough that it could have gone into leather as well and clothing. Um, it's it's really quite exciting this. Later rondel daggers would have had the big round rondels on both sides like I have can show you in that little picture there. there you can see them there fighting with their rondel daggers. Um, but this, as I said, is a slightly earlier one. There aren't many examples of this being made of wood. Naturally, this would normally have decayed. So I'm quite lucky to have this. Um, and being a hardwood, it's actually survived fairly well for the Thames. So anyway, that is my, my exciting little finds from this year. Oh, one other thing to show you. Very, very pretty. Little gift from Sam. Um, an absolutely beautiful clay pipe that she's decorated as a Christmas tree ornament. So that belongs back up there. Um, but anyway, I wanted to wish you all a very, very happy Christmas from me and my hairy hound here. Um, Frida, to see your head rather than your other end. There we go. So this is Frida and the hairy hound. Um, and wishing you all a lovely, lovely Christmas and hope to see you on the foreshore sometime soon. Take care. Mm -hmm.